Something caught my attention the other day and I wanted to discuss it with you, as is usually the case when I find something of interest online. Under the trending tab of Twitter was a discussion of myocarditis, a condition of the heart wherein it becomes inflamed and the beats become irregular. It's also become the rallying cry of vaccine skeptics everywhere as a way of dissuading people from taking the vaccine. Under this trending discussion, I found several public figures rallying around this image, a graph displaying athlete collapses and deaths throughout the year of 2021. The tweet I first came around was from Dennis Rancor and had been shared over 500 times as of the time of me discovering it. With such an overwhelmingly popular response to one public figure, I just had to talk about it. So let's take a look at this graph first before we delve into its source. After all, many of the responses I saw to this tweet appeared to be from people taking it at face value, not looking into where it actually came from. And I mean, why wouldn't you? Just look at this graph. It has everything you need in a credible piece of visual information. It has colors, an x-axis that's labeled, a title. How could I not believe it? But in all seriousness, there was something that immediately caught my eye when I saw this graph, and that was the extremely rapid upward trend in collapses from May until October. Of course, the people who created this graph would have you believe that this massive spike in collapses and deaths of any kind are due to the COVID vaccine. After all, these people aren't your typical do-nothing ordinary citizens, are they? These people are athletes, the healthiest people among our population. Surely, if they compete in sports, they're incapable of being unhealthy, right? Surely they were just fine before this vaccine came along, right? Well, about that. There's something else that happens in these months. Something that's been happening for thousands of years. It's summer. I'm talking about summer. So why is this important? Well, as someone who participates in the fitness, I can tell you absolutely and scientifically that exercising in the summer is, scientifically speaking, fucking knackering. It's exhausting. You get dehydrated, your body feels like it's going to wear out at any moment, and you're just tired and uncomfortable all the time. It's almost common sense that people would be passing out and dying more in the hotter months, right? Heat can put a pretty high amount of stress on your cardiovascular system as your body attempts to cool down. If you're wearing clothes that limit your body's ability to cool down, say for instance American football pads which limit your body's ability to sweat and therefore stay cool, how is it any surprise that you're more likely to collapse? This graph is scary to look at because it makes it seem as though collapses, or as they want you to think of them, vaccine deaths, are exponentially increasing. That's what the website would have you believe anyway. But take another look at this graph. Notice how, after October, the deaths begin to taper off again and decrease. If it really was the case that vaccines are causing these deaths on an unprecedented scale and more and more people are being vaccinated every day, why would the deaths begin to decrease as the months get colder and colder? Shouldn't it be trending ever upwards with more and more people being vaccinated over time? If you'll allow me, I'd like to put forth an alternative explanation, one that's in keeping with the data that this graph is presenting to me, and that's that this graph represents the average amount of deaths per year as a result of heart conditions being triggered by sports. For several years now, August has continually been labelled as the deadliest month for sports. This is due in part to the heat I mentioned earlier, which exacerbates underlying health conditions to such an extent that sudden athlete deaths have been widely reported years before the coronavirus vaccine was even a thing. If you take into account other contributing factors to cardiac deaths such as obesity in young football athletes, poorly optimised training regimens, it's no wonder young athletes have been dropping dead for so long. Now I know what you're thinking. If August is the deadliest month, why do the deaths peak in October? Well, the answer to that is the same reason we have this coronavirus vaccine in the first place. We're in the middle of a pandemic. Most sports were delayed this year by at least a couple of months, and that explains why the deaths are offset. Look at the NFL preseason schedule for this year. Preseason training begins on the 12th of August, aka the deadliest month for sports. This is when the training for athletes will be made increasingly more intense, something commonly referred to as progressive overload. If you suddenly ramp up the intensity of cardiovascular training in a nation rife with steroid abuse, obesity, and that infamous hot weather, you are guaranteed to see an increase in cardiac collapses and deaths across the board, especially if you've been inactive throughout the summer and then immediately dive into competitive training before sports season. Look at this graph again. If we look at the exact point this graph tells us deaths and collapses rapidly begin to ramp up, you can definitively link it to the middle of August. Once again, August is cited as the deadliest month for athletes because of the stress put on your body by the heat in combination with intense training. I decided to do something in order to test this theory out. I decided to recreate this graph myself so I could add additional qualifiers and factors in the sudden increase in deaths. When you look at the average temperature per month in 
let's say America, because that's where the most stories come from on this website, you'll see something like this. The temperature peaks in August, which obviously tracks with it being the deadliest month for sports. Of course, when you look at this graph, August isn't the deadliest month. So how do you reconcile this? Luckily for me, goodsciencing.com lists each of the deaths cited in this graph, as well as where they happened. So when you take a look at the post-August peak in deaths leading all the way up until October, you'll be interested to know that all of a sudden there's a whole lot of European countries cited in the graph. So let's maintain the focus on America for a bit longer. When we remove all other countries from the equation in the graph, we get something like this. This is a lot more in keeping with my initial gut feeling that these athletes are not dying because of the vaccine, but because of the warmer weather. Now, all we have to do is account for the sudden increase in deaths after August. Remember what I said about the deaths ramping up in August? That's also exactly when preseason training starts for the NFL. It's the same with other sports, cited in a fair few deaths in this graph's collection of sources, which I'll get to later. It's your standard statistical correlation that doesn't equal causation, but of course the people behind this graph want you to think that the vaccines are deadly, so they'll resort to any dirty tricks they can to convince you as well. Luckily, I'm on Christmas holiday right now, so I have just enough time to meticulously and tediously comb through a bunch of these news stories they cite just to see how reliable they really are. Before we move on to the next segment, I wanted to account for that random increase in deaths after September. I combed through the list of deaths from October to December to see which of the deaths in the USA were actually caused by unexplainable cardiac issues. Of the 37 total incidents cited as happening in the USA, I discovered that an entire 10 of these deaths were either explicitly caused by something unrelated to the COVID vaccine, for example, one student dying of a brain aneurysm and one man dying from suicide not in the United States, or were linked to another, infinitely more plausible explanation. Several bodybuilders, for example, suffered cardiac problems often linked to anabolic steroid use, and if you think this guy wasn't on the juice, I've got a bridge to sell you. There's also the story of a professional MMA fighter who died of what the website called unexplained causes as a means of spreading distrust and speculation, but when you look into it, he died of CTE, which is caused by repeat trauma to the head, in an MMA fighter. So you get rid of all those lies in the later months, and yeah, there you have it, a chart of cardiac deaths that peaks in August, in keeping with scientific consensus from the past 20 years or so. Bear in mind that this is with the immensely dubious qualifier that any of this data is reliable in the first place. I know I've just used their own citations to debunk their claims, but I shouldn't have to tell you that the amount of stories and examples that have been stretched or misrepresented in the final three months alone just goes to show that intellectual integrity isn't too high on the list of priorities for these guys. I know I've left the first nine months untampered with to get this result, but let's examine what would happen if I went through the entire year in the way I did for these few months in order to examine if my own hypothesis was true. All that would happen is that I would discover more and more exaggerated and misrepresented cases and flat out lies, which, in case you haven't been paying attention, only further decreases the amount of deaths this website claims result from the vaccine. If I give them the benefit of the doubt and say that there are no more lies in the rest of this website, that still gives way to infinitely more plausible reasons for these collapses, which have been a documented phenomenon for years. For example, notice how the collapses in Australia stop being listed after February and jumpstart again in August. You know what happens during these months in Australia? February is at the tail end of the Australian summer, which starts in December. There is only one Australian death listed during August, during their winter, and after that, the deaths only begin to ramp up during September, the beginning of the Australian spring, and this trend carries on through the rest of the Australian summer months. I could honestly end the video right here, really. I've just proven that for people who claim to care about good science, truth, and free thought, they're incredibly keen to tell you what to think and will go to any length to do it, even lying to you and not understanding how seasons work. But I'm going to keep going, just so you can see how deep the rabbit hole really goes. So speaking of these people being absolutely full of it, this brings me to the next batch of misinformation on this hell site, where they spend an incredible amount of time priming their audience, who already believes that the vaccines are harmful, that they are indeed correct in this presupposition. It is definitely not normal for young athletes to suffer from cardiac arrests or to die while playing their sport but this year it is happening. All of these hard issues and deaths come shortly after they got a COVID vaccine. While it is possible this can happen to people who did not get a COVID vaccine, the sheer numbers clearly point to the only obvious cause. Where are the fact checkers? Readers are writing to us asking for comparisons from previous years. Some say without that, these results mean nothing. That's not true, because if we'd seen this in previous years, it would be well known and others would have documented it. We will try, but it is a lot of work. 
Where are the fact checkers? Where is the mainstream media? Some have piles of money from Bill Gates. Why are they not proving us wrong by piling on and showing the documented athlete deaths from 2019, 2018, 2017, and the previous decade? They are nowhere to be found because this number of athlete deaths is abnormal, and they know it. They have money from people who don't want journalists poking around. So that's why they don't try to fact check these reports, or show previous year numbers. So apparently no one is discussing sudden cardiac deaths in athletes from previous years. Well, allow me. Let's start in 2020 right before the vaccine was released, if that's far back enough for you. If it isn't, don't worry, I'm just getting started. Here's a paper from July 2020, a few months into the pandemic, explaining the causes and demographics of sudden cardiac deaths in athletes. It turns out that when this study was written, over 75% of non-traumatic deaths in athletes happened as a result of cardiovascular disorders, be these inherited or acquired. When you look at the demographic breakdown, once again published way before Good Sciencing's graph, and data was, you'll find some interesting threads that run much further back than this year alone. The average age for athletes suddenly dying was between 14 to 30 years. The mean age, as discovered in the largest study conducted on this issue that examined 1800 total deaths, is around 19 years old. Men are also much likelier to die of these issues than women at a ratio of 9 to 1. I'm already seeing some huge overlap between this study and the deaths cited in this graph, but let's take it one step further. Let's examine these deaths by sport. A study from the UK determined that football was the sport most likely to result in sudden cardiac death at a number of 6.8 in every 100,000, which is above average for the UK. In the USA, basketball is also a deadlier sport than average, with sudden cardiac death happening to one in every 58,000 players. This is because these sports often include start-stop play styles, which leads the study to believe there is a link between adrenaline spikes and sudden cardiac death in athletes. There's also the fact that these athletes are more often than not asymptomatic before their sudden deaths. This is why the issue is so devastating to hear about because for the most part it is unprecedented and completely unexpected. I understand that this website wants to find an underlying cause to these unexplained deaths. I know that it's scary to see people who were previously thought to be healthy suddenly dying with seemingly no explanation. But that's no excuse to fearmonger and cause even more people to get sick from a disease that can be prevented. That's inexcusable. Let's go even further back in time. Here's a newspaper article from 2018 that discusses collapses in endurance athletes, one in particular from cardiomyopathy. This article cites a number I came across a few times, that being that every week 12 people aged 35 and under will die suddenly from underlying heart conditions. Every week in the UK. Again, this is within the demographic of 35 years and younger. 12 per week means over 600 per year in the UK alone, even in this article from before the pandemic. That's an enormous amount of people dying from heart problems. And yet, when GoodScienceing.com pulls news reports from all over the world, including deaths that were explicitly caused by other things, they don't even hold a candle to that number. I guess it really is coming home. Again, Good Sciencing is taking an already existing phenomenon and misrepresenting what's actually causing it. I found further studies dating all the way back to 2014 and another one from 2003. This is not a new issue. Sudden cardiac death is a problem that's been rampant in sports for decades. The sooner we recognize this, the sooner we also realize that this website, and by extension the people who created it, want to fearmonger about the vaccines. I mean, take a look at the affirmations they want you to do if you believe in the safety of the vaccines. The COVID vaccine is a normal vaccine. The COVID vaccine is safe these injuries and deaths are normal. And, I mean, yeah, these injuries and deaths are normal. I wish they weren't, but these are a long documented phenomenon since way before the vaccines and whatever side effects you wish they had at this scale. Do you want to know how incompetent this website really is though? I already mentioned that this website straight up lies about what some of these people died of in the later months, but it's not even in those later months alone. Their list extends to the very beginning of January, which is extremely early to claim that so many people were vaccinated by this point. What's even more outrageous is that a lot of these early deaths, once again, are either explicitly not caused by the vaccine, or if you want to get a little bit more QAnon and say that the causes of death were faked, were in locations that weren't yet eligible to receive the vaccine. This is where the words research and facts and, you know, competence when referring to this article and the people who made it really begin to do a lot of work. So we take a look at the earliest dates on the website. What do we find? Well, 
there are several deaths here as well that either have a more plausible explanation to them or are explicitly caused by something else or were definitively not caused by the vaccines because the deaths don't add up with the timeline. I'm not going to go through these dates chronologically because I find it flows better if I lump each category of mistake together rather than go back and forth. And yes, that does mean that this website makes the same mistake more than once within the first few examples. The first couple of deaths of interest I want to examine are those that occurred on the 6th of February and the 22nd of February. Those are of Clement Luchu from Cameroon and Dale Best from Australia, respectively. I lumped these two citations together because, believe it or not, there was no way these people were vaccinated when they died. Clement Luchu died in Cameroon on the 6th of February. Cameroon didn't receive their first doses of the coronavirus vaccine until mid-April. You know, unless this website was more than two months late to report something so monumentally important within their country. That's how news works, right? The same goes for Dale Best from Australia. He died on the 22nd of February, the day that vaccines began in Australia. So you're saying there's a chance, you might be thinking if you're a little bit more of the pinboard and string type. Not really, sorry, unless Mr. Best was working at a hospital at the time that he died. The vaccine roll-up began with prioritizing healthcare and emergency workers, so there's zero chance that Mr. Best qualified for that if he was in any condition to be playing competitive rugby. Next up, you have several deaths that could feasibly line up with the vaccine timeline, but aren't likely to have been caused by them as there's a much simpler explanation. These are the deaths of Abdul Atef in Egypt on the 8th of March and Andy Hammond in America on the 20th of March. Abdul Atef died after collapsing and swallowing his tongue. You'd be wrong to even assume that this is a thing caused by the vaccine. A year before, another player, Mohammed Hani al Khuri, died in a very similar way. This isn't because he got a pre-order copy of the vaccine or anything, but because Egyptian football games have notoriously poor health and safety measures in place for when something like this happens. This is even in the report that the website itself cites as evidence, so I have no idea how they missed this unless they were trying to misrepresent the facts. The same goes for the death of Andy Hammond. Hammond was a bodybuilder, 54 years old at the time of his death. He died of a pulmonary embolism, which is a blockage in the arteries in your lungs. Once again, this is not a fringe case. Bodybuilders have been dying of these for decades. This is because of the link between pulmonary embolism and usage of anabolic steroids. If a bodybuilder conceals their usage of steroids, for example, almost every bodybuilder ever, this can delay diagnosis of pulmonary embolism and allow it to grow more deadly over time. And no, for God's sake, I'm not saying that Hammond was a bad person if he used steroids. I just think it's important to know all the facts. If you think this is natural without gear, I have to question how qualified you really are to comment on the safety of vaccines. And this goes for the death of boxing legend Marvelous Marvin Hagler on the 13th of March. His death was listed as natural causes by his family. The only link they have to a vaccine is that his opponent claimed it was because of the vaccine. You can't use some guy saying so as scientific evidence. That's not how any of this works. That's like me saying, hey, I have no proof of this, but just because I said so, whoever put this list together is a straight up Nazi or a Nazi sympathizer or aligned with Nazis. You gotta believe me because I said so. On the 30th of January, you have the French footballer Garrison Innocent collapsing during a match. And then you dig a little deeper into it and you find out that he suffered what's known as tachycardia, wherein your heart beats faster than normal over 100 beats per minute. What causes tachycardia? Sports. Yeah. On the same day, an American basketballer by the name of Wayne Radford passed away. His name actually comes up twice on this site, once in the statistics that were added to the graph and once in a later list of people who maybe died of the vaccine, but we can't be sure. Well, which is it? You can't include this death in your phony stats and then issue a correction saying, oh well, maybe he didn't die of the vaccine, who knows, and then still use his death in your graph. Actually, you could probably duplicate this list of deaths and collapses and paste it into the may or may not be vax related segment, considering that this website offers no definitive proof or even evidence besides citing websites that are equally speculative as this one and saying, hey, he died of a heart thingy, must be the vaccine. Speaking of the may or may not be caused by the vaccine segment, I have to point out how absurd and egregious some of these examples are. I know they also have the or may not thrown in there, but the fact that they allow any room for interpretation in these examples goes to show that what they really mean is, we think these were caused by the vaccine, but we don't want to get sued. You have Olivia Podmore from Australia and Cameron Burrell from America who, on the 12th of August, both tragically took their own lives. What's really disgusting in the latter case especially is that the website still claims it's vaccine related. Was he vaxxed? And if so, did he know his career was over? 
fuck you. Here's one that's a little more ridiculous. 31-year-old Glenn Foster died after he got into a high-speed police chase in Alabama and crashed into a tree. They still list this as potentially vaccine-related. Did the jab make his arm sore and prevent him from steering away from the tree or something? This is what I mean when I say these people will reach for the most out there conclusions they can think of just to not have to admit they're wrong. There are two more cases I want to discuss because they epitomize my problems with this website, both its incompetence and sinister misinformation. There's the death of a 16 year old boy, Drake Geiger, who died of hypothermia. He was six foot three and almost 400 pounds. He died during football practice in 91 degree Fahrenheit heat with an internal temperature of 122 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 50 degrees Celsius. The truly disgusting thing about this website's coverage of this young boy's death is their remark at the end. Sadly, there is no information on VAC status, but it would be pertinent. Too many autopsies are hidden or contain scant information, as though they want to protect Big Pharma. All we want is the truth. I don't have enough words to describe how disgusting and unethical it is to take any story of a family losing their child before his time and exploit any uncertainty around his death to peddle your fear mongering. If you really cared about the facts, you wouldn't have to resort to such shallow assumptions based not on the evidence you have, but that which you don't. There is no merit behind this website and its claims, and I hope I've managed to illuminate that a little bit more. If you still think this website has any shred of credibility left, I hope this final example will convince you otherwise. In their main list of deaths at the beginning of April, the creators of this list cite the death of a 15 year old girl that happened in April. I looked into this case when I was examining how reliable each of these examples were and this was the one that actually angered me, not for the lack of ethics or truth, although that does contribute, but because of how buffoonish and incompetent it revealed this website and its creators to be. So you click on this article describing this death in April and wait a second, this article is from August. Is this article reported four months too late? That's what the news does, right? No, actually, the date on this article is accurate, obviously. So where does that April date come from? If you take a look at the article, you'll notice that underneath the photograph of the girl's father is a description of the image. McAllen High School soccer coach Patrick Arney during a playoff soccer game against Cedar Park on Tuesday, April 6th, 2021 in Cullallan, Corpus Christi. Yeah. It's exactly what you think it is. These Muppets actually thought the caption of the article's image was the description of when the death actually occurred. This is the only place in the article that the date and location cited on Good Sciencing appears, so I can think of no other explanation than whoever cited this article read the first date and location they could find and just threw it in among the rest. This is the level of scientific rigor and deep insight you can expect from these people. They can't even date an event properly because they didn't read the full news article that they cite. If they did, they would realize that the actual location of this girl's death is listed two lines below. It's honestly embarrassing. But even if they were right about when Moira Arney died, all that would do is undermine this website's claims about the vaccine causing her death. If you know anything about the timeline of corona vaccines in America, this should have immediately sent alarm bells ringing through your head before you even saw the date in the article. Goodsciencing.com claims that Moira Claire Arney died on the 6th of April in Corpus Christi. The earliest date I could find as to when 15 year olds would have been eligible for a vaccine was in this report from the 11th of May. That's an entire month after this website thinks this girl died. So either way, they got the facts horrendously wrong, but honestly, I have no idea how you don't understand the basic facts of when vaccines are available before you begin to make these claims. I do actually. It's very obvious that whatever dumbass runs this website simply googled athlete cardiac death and linked all of the articles they could find and blamed it on the vaccine. It doesn't even matter if another cause of death was already explained as we've already seen. It's so cynical and anti-scientific and flat out embarrassing. How do you fuck up basic information this badly? Who even wrote this bollocks anyway? I did some digging when I first found this website. While I couldn't find exactly who created it, I got a bit of a clearer picture from what I found. It seems to have been made by your typical anti-big government free thinkers trademark who want an excuse to spread misinformation as they deem fit under the guise of my freedoms. You can tell this from the description of their website claiming that science must be open to discussion, anything else is tyranny. And I would agree with you were it not for the fact that what this website's creators deem as science is little more than cherry picked newspaper articles which don't even support their predetermined and conclusions a lot of the time because they're too incompetent to even skew data in their favor properly. When I first found this website, it was pretty bare bones.
phones. Besides the sports graph, there wasn't really too much that jumped out at me. They have an article about disgraced Dr. Robert Malone, who takes credit for other people's scientific discoveries and makes unfounded claims about vaccines because, yeah, that's who you want to trust when it's people's lives affected by your work. You've probably heard of this guy because during the time I've been researching and writing this video, he's appeared on the Joe Rogan experience. So I've come back to this point in the script because it actually pisses me off that Joe Rogan continues to do things like this. Robert Malone is a phony, a fraud, a no-good, do-nothing bozo whose only claim to fame is his famous claim of single-handedly creating mRNA vaccine technology despite the fact that it was the cumulative efforts of hundreds of scientists over several years. He will deliberately appear on ill-reputed podcasts who are either too stupid to be able to prove him wrong on any of his claims or will deliberately allow him to flat out lie about his achievements because, well, we got the guy who invented the vaccines on our show and he agrees with us so we can't be wrong. He's little more than a scientific clout chaser. When he felt that he didn't get the credit he deserved, he described it as intellectual rape. Funny, when you consider the sheer numbers of other scientists he's ignoring in his attempts to take full credit for the mRNA vaccines. There's also the fact that he thinks mRNA vaccines worsen COVID cases. You know, the vaccines that he claims to have developed. He claims this because after catching COVID, he decided to get the vaccine to help deal with the long-term side effects, but actually caught long-term side effects from the vaccine, which he took in order to mitigate the long-term side effects of COVID. And there's also the fact that he's made claims which are demonstrably false. He made the claim that Israel and Pfizer partnered to cover up potential side effects of the vaccine when in fact Israel has been one of the more vocal parties when it comes to vaccine hesitancy. If he didn't look up this basic piece of information before claiming it, because if he did he would realize instantly that he's wrong, well that's not a very good endorsement of his work as a researcher. Of course, there's always the other explanation, that he's just deliberately lying in order to get attention and fame, and in that regard he's not alone. There's another segment here about vaccine chasing, written by one Richard M. Fleming. There's not a lot to say about this, besides the fact that if you look at this graph and have absolutely no idea what the hell you're looking at, you'll probably scroll down to the description underneath to see what it actually means. It's like the opposite of a picture book or something, like a bedtime story for conspiracy theorists. So what is there to see about this information? Well, it's just a list of vaccine side effects and things you might suffer from as a result of it. But Notice something interesting about how this paragraph is written. At random points, you'll see that words are capitalized, almost randomly. It's not very good grammar for a scientist, is it? And what's even worse is that it's not done randomly. The words that are capitalized are chosen to be that way because those are the elements of information the writer of this article, Richard M. Fleming, wants you to come away with. You know, doctors have concerns about the inflammothrombotic response to these drug vaccine biologic agents. I googled all these terms, by the way, just to see what would come up. Nothing did. This author's just throwing a bunch of buzzwords together to make vaguely scientific sounding phrases that don't actually exist to my knowledge. Who wrote this again? Richard M. Fleming? I wonder what credentials this guy has. Oh, what's this? He had his medical license indefinitely suspended back in 2012 for committing healthcare fraud? It looks like his appeals are still getting denied to this day. This is the first thing that came up about this guy when I googled him, by the way. The article that clearly states that he's not to be trusted with the one thing the website wants you to trust about him. These are the people this website has to push, just to pretend that they have any credibility when it comes to public health. Disgraced doctors and hack frauds who, if you do even the most cursory research into them before putting them up onto your website, turn out to be completely full of it. Just to reiterate, these are the people we're supposed to be trusting to find out the truth behind science of the vaccines. People who either have no idea how to look into the people they cite, or do know, but don't even care. It's either misleading or incredibly embarrassing, and I'm honestly not sure which is worse. There's one other segment of this website that lends itself to my conclusion that they're just looking for data that reinforces their opinions and throwing it all together for their target audience, and that's under the government overreach segment. This was the first part of the website outside of the graph we just looked at that I really took to because, I mean, it really just does give the game away, doesn't it? For some reason, there's a group of people who 
rather than actually being opposed to the vaccine for whatever reason, are intensely focused on the principles of being told what to do. To these people, having things like laws in place to guarantee public safety is tantamount to somewhere like Nazi Germany. I decided to do some digging into this segment just to see what kinds of dreadful human rights violations this website is uncovering and exposing to the rest of the world. So I clicked on this section for the first time, and to my surprise there was only one article there, which is a bit unexpected. If this is such a widespread and important issue, I would expect there to be a huge backlog of incidents they had at the ready to convince me. Even now, a whole month after I discovered this page for the first time, there's only been one new article added. It almost feels like this isn't as big of a problem as you make it out to be, but I'm sure it's a compelling argument, right? What eloquent and insightful analysis will we find further in? Oh, it's a YouTube video. Oh, it's a guy talking to his camera. I won't do a step-by-step -step rebuttal of this video like I've done in the past because if I do this video is going to be hours long, but the main gist of it is that this guy, the Aussie Cossack, is cheering on the anti-lockdown protests happening in Melbourne, Australia. This video was released on the same day as the announcement that people who were eligible for a vaccine but didn't get it would be unable to visit certain locations like hospitals and aged care homes. And I mean, even if you weren't banned from these locations, I have to ask. Why would you visit these places full of sick and at-risk people if you knew you were a vector for a deadly illness? Oh, hang on, my mistake. According to many POC, by which I mean people of COVID, the virus is no deadlier than the common cold, and that can't be dangerous to take into a hospital because look, it's common. Except people do die from the common cold, or at least complications stemming from it. This is especially true in people with certain conditions which can weaken your immune system and make you more susceptible to serious complications, aka the kind of people you'd find in a hospital or aged care home. So even if the coronavirus was only as deadly as the common cold, that doesn't mean anything because it can still be deadly to some people. So why do you feel entitled to go around and make things more dangerous for the people that can't actually improve their chances of keeping safe? This is why the anti-vax movement frustrates me so much. For all of their virtue signaling about standing up for my rights and my principles and taking a stand against injustice, that only applies to yourselves and not the people around you. You don't actually care to stop and consider that there might be a reason we tell people to stay home when they're sick. And I'll tell you now, it's not only about you. You're so focused on not being told what to do that you're completely ignoring why you're being told to do it. You aren't brave for refusing to do the bare minimum to protect the people around you. You're just selfishly putting yourself and the people around you in danger. It's like the medical equivalent of drunk driving. The most offensive thing about this weird belief you have isn't even that you're skeptical, it's that you cite these outlandish, offensively falsified lies that take not even 30 seconds to look up and disprove or realize that it's more complex than what you've been led to believe. You're not a bad person for being ignorant. There's plenty of things I don't know either. You're a bad person because you're lazy and complacent in your ignorance because it gives you a much stronger foundation than actually searching for the truth of the matter and challenging your own beliefs in the process. So you just listen to people like this Aussie Cossack fellow here who, in what I can only describe as a pale imitation of a Britain First video, plays triumphant music, sits in front of his country's flag and spews platitudes like patriotism, free thinkers, freedom, and you lap it all up because it hits those sweet spots in your libertarian brain and validates your belief that being opposed to mainstream thought always makes you correct. He says that the movement is going mainstream, which is a pretty bog standard way of making yourself confident in what you believe. No one wants to be part of a fringe group with insane takes, so it's always nice to artificially inflate how many people believe in the same things as you. I mean, just listen to how this guy describes it. It's become uh, viral. Yes, yes it has. Most of this video isn't even this guy talking, it's just footage of an anti-lockdown protest which, having seen these in a bunch of different countries, are all the same. It's very impressive that across three different continents I've seen these protests in, no matter who's in charge at the time, the talking points, attitudes, and even organizations represented at these things always manages to be the same. It's almost like the rise of the alt-right has paved the way for misinformation to be more easily produced by a select few and then consumed by a much larger audience. Oh look, a Gadsden flag. I'm sure there's no significance in an American icon being present at an Australian rally. Oh look, a Trump flag hailing him as an action hero. I see no way this protest could have possibly been astroturfed by foreign parties. Who is this guy again? The Aussie Cossack? I wonder what he's all about. Oh, so his real name is Simeon Boykov. That doesn't sound particularly Australian, but I'm sure it's nothing important. I wonder what this guy's known for. There must be a reason that good science incites him, right? 
Oh no. What was it I said earlier? In what I can only describe as a pale imitation of a Britain First video, yeah. So this guy's been closely associated with both the Australia First Party, who's basically Britain First but in Australia, and the Golden Dawn Party. In case you didn't know who the Golden Dawn Party is, and I wouldn't be surprised because its leaders have all been jailed since last year, is a Greek neo-Nazi political party. Their leaders were put on trial from 2015 until October 2020 in what has largely been described as the biggest Nazi trial since Nuremberg. What was that other thing I said earlier? That's like me saying, hey, I have no proof of this, but just because I said so, whoever put this list together is a straight up Nazi or a Nazi sympathizer or aligned with Nazis. And I'm telling this to you because of something that Mr. Boykov says in his video towards all of the people who are vaccinated. And those who are on the wrong side of history, Nuremberg 2.0 is still going, it's still going ahead. So to summarize, Nuremberg 2.0 is a phrase largely attributed to the German lawyer Rainer Fulmich, who believes that the COVID vaccines were created by Bill Gates as a means of population control. He wants Bill Gates and other elites, wink wink nudge nudge, to stand trial for their crimes against humanity in manufacturing a fake pandemic. Hence the phrase Nuremberg 2.0, likening Bill Gates and his friends to the Nazis who stood trial in Nuremberg. And that's so funny to me because like, that's your guys, Mr. Boykov. <laughs> You're literally associated with a political group who was involved in an actual Nuremberg 2.0. I mean, look, they gave him a plaque. How is the man who styles himself as a military officer despite having never served, who gets given plaques by neo-Nazi political parties because of his service to them, qualified to talk about government overreach? I mean, look at the flag these guys have. That should tell you everything you need to know about them as a group. And this brings me to the other group that Mr. Boykov is affiliated with, Australia First. I couldn't believe this when I first found it, I just couldn't. It's too perfect. Australia First, much like their British counterpart, is a far-right ultra-nationalist party that wants to isolate itself from anything foreign. You can see this ideology in their emblem, which contains the phrase Australia for the Australians. And I mean, yeah, sure, why not? I'm honestly surprised that Australia First is so open about their intention with this emblem. I mean, after all, Britain First doesn't Wait a second. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, actually. Yeah, I'm honestly surprised these guys are so much more open about their actual agenda than Britain First is. They both want the same thing, to isolate themselves from any supposed foreign influence. It's just that these guys are a lot more honest and, as a result, much less popular as a result. It must be nice to lie about your true intentions to gain a larger following and greater influence over them. Speaking of Simeon Boykov, let's delve into that guy's history a little bit. Apparently he was born into a Russian household in Australia. Now, there's nothing wrong with this particular piece of the puzzle, but what about once you start putting the rest of the pieces together? Boykov has built connections to the Stratensky Monastery in Moscow. What's the significance of that? Well, the person who mentored him, Father Shevkanov, is often referred to as Vladimir Putin's spiritual advisor. The man that good sciencing refers to as an advocate against government overreach literally shares a mentor with a dictator. So why would this be the case? There's the fact that Simeon Boykov, despite having Aussie in his moniker, has never truly considered himself to be Australian. He's quoted as saying, We never felt ourselves to be Australian. We were aliens there. I consider myself to be a Russian. Again, you might be thinking that there's not a lot wrong with this quote. After all, there's a ton of diaspora across the world who consider themselves in relation to their ancestral homeland. And yeah, there's nothing wrong with that if you take it at face value. But in that case, what you also have to take at face value is Mr. Boykov's active hostility towards Australia as a nation because of his Russian heritage. You can hear it from the man himself. We have a unique opportunity to support Russia from within an enemy state. It says it all really, doesn't it? Mr. Boykov is trying to sow discord and civil unrest in Australia by creating a mistrust of their government so that the people will want to fight back. He equates himself to a spy behind enemy lines, willing to do anything to accomplish his mission. Waging an information war. There's a reason he's formed the Cossack Society of Australia, and that's so that he can spread pro-Putin and pro-Russian propaganda in Australia. I'd go so far as to say that Mr. Boykov doesn't really care about being told what to do. After all, he and the rest of his cronies within his organization all fashion themselves after a military branch. You know, that military that famously takes orders from nobody. Rather, I propose that he's capitalizing off of the useful idiots that do care about being told what to do in order to further his own goals. 
Enter goodsciencing.com, the useful idiots I just mentioned. In their attempt to fight back against being told what to do, which they call government overreach, they have cited a man who is acting on behalf of the Russian government and completely opposed to those he claimed to support. He's hiding behind the anti-lockdown sentiment in order to create further civil unrest and turn people towards Russia and their leaders. And it's working. The comments under his most recent videos about Putin and the propaganda surrounding him are full of people saying they'd rather have Putin or the Russian system of government than whatever they have now. Boykov has successfully created civil unrest in Australia and caused people to look for an alternative that he already has ready to suggest to them. Vladimir Putin. So in their attempt to fight government overreach, goodsciencing.com have managed to aid and support the overreach of a different, even more insidious government. Nice going, guys. To anybody who so far refused to get the vaccine because of misinformation like this, these are the people that you're supporting the efforts of. I'm not saying you're a Nazi or aligned with Vladimir Putin if you're vaccine hesitant, but you sure as hell are falling for their tricks with no resistance or hesitancy towards what they have to say. This is an extremely dangerous thing to just passively allow to fester and not challenge, considering that every single rung of this rotten ladder you climb is another level of manipulation culminating in… well this. So yeah, it seems as though this entire movement has been astroturfed and that these movements from Russia to the States to Australia are all way more intertwined than we would have expected. If you're unvaccinated and by some slim chance still watching this, I hope I've managed to open your eyes as to what's really happening and what you're falling for. There's a lot of manipulation going on surrounding the pandemic, but it's not from the side you think it is. You're not a bad person for falling for misinformation. That's the point of misinformation. But I hope that with this added clarity, you've been able to see things a bit clearer and realize that you're not going to get Schindler's listed if you protect yourself and those around you from a virus that, quite frankly, I'm getting rather bored of now. Seriously, I just want my life back. If you're really that scared of any potential vaccine side effects, just go and get screened or something. I don't know. I can't tell you what your medical history or situation is going to be or what it might be. Just stop uncritically enabling Russian psyops, please. I guess that's the main takeaway from this video really, isn't it? Every one of these people who claims to be looking out for their own individual freedoms and the people around them, whether intentionally or not, is playing into somebody else's manipulation tactics and their agenda. You have goodsciencing.com who's lifting deaths from all over the world to make an argument that seems very America focused and as far as I could tell this site did originate in America but they're using a proxy so I can't be certain. You have these guys citing protests in Australia that use American iconography like the Gadsden flag and this god awful Trump flag to demonstrate their freedoms. These protests are being covered by Simeon Boykov, an Australian of Russian descent who is in turn being used by Australian ultranationalists and a Greek political party that bases its ideology of that in Nazi Germany. Mr Boykov, however, is also using these fascist groups in turn to further spread his own brand of pro-Putin propaganda in a way that Australian fascists will find palatable, which will then therefore become more palatable for Americans like those from goodsciencing.com to use as their own brand of propaganda. All of these parties and nations are using the same circular logic and talking points that they're getting lost in whose brand of fascism in whose. It doesn't even seem like these guys even know which culture they belong to or whose country or nation they're advocating for the freedoms of as long as it's the same flavour of fascist arguments and policies. Say, that reminds me of something. Thank you very much for watching everyone. I hope that with this video, as with all the rest of my videos, that I've been able to combat the misinformation that never seems to stop on the internet. If you found this video to be eye-opening or insightful or even just the tiniest bit funny, I'd like to ask you to please consider subscribing to my YouTube channel for more content in the future. I have a backlog of varied content that I want to tackle and I'd love for all of you to be there when I do. Speaking of subscriptions, there's one more thing I need to address before we wrap up properly, and that's today's soy. Segway! Do you like deep dives into niche rabbit holes that are also made accessible to your average dude? Do you enjoy content from the likes of ContraPoints or Philosophy Tube, but wonder if it's possible to achieve similar quality and production value without their insane budgets that they have at their disposal? Luckily for us, today's featured YouTube proves that it can indeed be done. Addis Online is a YouTube video essayist that delves into cultural niches with the same production value, sense of humour and style that you would expect from a AAA bread tuber, except all done on a shoestring budget. 
Their video on conspiracy theorists is especially well done, taking seemingly small-scale conspiracy theories and explaining the broader cultural impacts and implications of people that think this way. The production value and quality with so little a budget really is a testament to the love somebody can have for their craft, and it's criminal that their channel only has 250 subscribers. So yeah, go check them out. Speaking of shameless promotion, if you want to support me financially, please consider donating to my Patreon in the description below. It's a flat fee for every subscription, and you get all sorts of nice bonuses like sneak peeks of upcoming content and the ability to vote which upcoming video ideas you want to see tackled first. I'm also playing with the idea of a Q&A after every video to answer further questions that anyone might have. Alright, that's all for now. The next video is going to be something of a return to my channel's roots. After that, I guess we'll see what the people decide. Until next time.